Dr. Holmeyer, uh, I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to the Truett Church Network for hosting Todd Talks, these bi-weekly webinar conversations that I'm privileged to have with Christian ministers, leaders, and thinkers uh, are enjoyable, at least for me, and I trust and pray that they're helpful for those who are able to join us, either in real time or later. Today, it is my utter joy, delight to be joined by my friends, Drs. Steve Wells and Ralph West. I'll tell you the truth, I'm tempted to elaborate at some length upon all that these guys have achieved and accomplished in study and ministry. I'm going to push back against that temptation so that we'll have more time for conversation. Those who are interested, of course, I encourage you to check out their impressive credentials more fully uh, online. It won't take much of a Google search and you'll find them front and center. For now, let me simply introduce uh, my friend, Dr. Steve Wells, as a three-time Baylor graduate and as pastor of the historic strategic South Main Baptist Church in Houston, Texas, and Dr. Ralph Douglas West as the pastor and founder of the expansive and impactful Church Without Walls in Houston, as well as, I might add, with great gladness, the recently appointed Moore Visiting Professor of Ministry Guidance at Baylor University. Welcome, Pass. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for taking the time to visit today. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Thank you. I've invited the two of you along uh, to join me today, not only because you're beloved brothers, but also because you're Christian co-laborers in H-Town together. You proclaim the gospel from your pulpits and with your lives, day in and day out. We are grateful for your winsome witness. Steve, can I begin with you? Sure. Uh, allow me to begin <laughs> by simply asking how you and Pass, as Ralph is affectionately and respectfully known, uh, became friends, how your relationship has matured over the years, and some of the ways that you all have worked together, joined hands and hearts in ministry. Yeah, that's a great question. It's a good story. Uh, we, we met in the best of conceivable ways. We went to the Holy Land together. So in 2011, I was putting together uh, the strategy for a sabbatical uh, and was asking you about, I could, I, I'd like to spend some time in the Holy Land. And you had already put together a, a trip for Truett students and Pass was going to be the pastor on the trip. And I got to horn in. Uh, and so we got to be the co-pastors on the trip. So we, I mean, we were really having conversations on the bus every day as we're walking the steps where Jesus walked and uh, seeing the thing, you know, to, to have conversations at the Mount of the Beatitudes and at the synagogue in, in Capernaum uh, to, to walk in Bad Yashayim together and talk about suffering. I mean, it, it's hard to think of a better way to get to know a brother in Christ. And then we came back to Houston and I became aware uh, I was woefully ignorant. It turns out I discover routinely how woefully ignorant I am about the ills of the world but became aware of payday lending and got very involved in trying to pass an ordinance in our city that, met, that, that paralleled other ordinances that were being written across the state. Uh, and you know, if you wanna get something done in Houston, you call pass. So I called Ralph and uh, said, would, would you help us with this? And, and we worked together and we were successful in leading a coalition of faith leaders to work with the mayor, uh, Anise Parker, and to, to uh, get a, a, an ordinance passed. We did some work on the national level together, traveled to D.C. to do that. Uh, and then we, we've hosted uh, events at South Main from time to time. Ralph's preached at South Main. I, I, I do have to tell you, it is a self-defeating strategy to invite past to preach in your church because <laughs> then people know what good preaching is. Um, so we, it's just been that. And so in the it's organically grown and we we made a commitment early on believing that if we would choose to be friends and make time for our friendship to meet together for lunches not not when we had an agenda but just to get to know each other that God would honor that and would use our relationship to to bless and grow his kingdom and so in these pandemic days you know when after the murder of George Floyd realizing our, our church needed to do something about that. And that had to start in some way with relationships. Uh, Ralph and I reached out to each other. I genuinely don't remember who called who first and said, our, our churches need to do something together 
Uh, and that's the, that's getting into later parts of the conversation, but that's sort of how we got here. Thanks, Steve. Um, I remember so fondly our time in Israel together. And all I can say is God willing next year in Jerusalem, uh, Amen. We're, we're all so ready uh, to return to some degree of normalcy. I have and, some real hopes. I mean, the, yes. the, that, that our churches will take a trip together to the Holy Land now. Like that, to, to mirror that experience, what we got to do to begin our relationship, to take people with us and sit at table as brothers and sisters there. May it be, even as early as next March, right? That, that's right. I got dates in a brochure if anybody wants to go. <laughs> Come on. The water's fine. Although I remember past when we were baptizing <laughs> Jacqueline Howard, that water didn't seem fine at all. It, it was cold. <laughs> it turns out the Jordan River is chilly and wide. It is chilly. Well, Pat, <laughs> Pat, both you and Steve uh, recently spoke at George Floyd's memorial service, of which Steve uh, mentioned, and you did so to great effect. Uh, may I simply say, uh, personally, on, and on behalf of all those who are watching and will watch today and uh, at a later time, thank you. Uh, and, and I mean that. You, you pastored us in that moment. Uh, we were grieving, we continue to grieve, but your words, your leadership, both yours and Steve's, were a balm to us uh, in that time. Well, Pass, w word has it that uh, it was you that recommended that Steve be included in the memorial service. And I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing with us what prompted you to recommend Steve and what what is it that Steve shared on that day that you think is of imbibing importance to us during these uh, days of challenge and change? Uh, <clears throat> Remus Wright is the pastor of uh, Fountain of Praise and he's a personal friend and as uh, he was mapping out the worship service for that day, they gave him freedom to select different people. And so he asked me uh, a question about uh, inviting a few people. And so uh, I asked him, I said, can I make a recommendation? I said, because I believe that on that day, you need somebody that will speak to our faith community and not based upon name recognition, visibility, but somebody who's put in the work. So that was the first thing that, that uh, I believe the Holy Spirit really laid on my heart is somebody who had done the work. That Steve was not just somebody who was stepping in, in quotes, who happened to be a white pastor in Houston, but a pastor who had put in the work. He mentioned uh, the journey of the payday lending and putting in place of equality for uh, people that were marginalized. So uh, he had done the work, but beyond that, payday lender, another thing that uh, Steve had done, he had hosted this poverty conference. Mm. And it was an international conference on poverty that I was part of and was invited to come in uh, to South Maine with he and other people. So he had done the work. And then the third thing was that South Maine historically had put in a lot of work uh, mm -hmm. from the days of my growing up in Houston and re remembering when the, Dr. Schaefer was there and of course beyond that Westmoreland and, and, and an incredible story that goes on with his life and in the, uh, the community, uh, particularly the African American. So he had done the work, he had passed a church that had had a track record of doing the work. And then finally, I knew what Steve could do. I knew that he could communicate it. And so it wouldn't be some kind of token expression that he would stand in the role as a prophet, as he did, and speak to that community from the scripture. Now, I keep saying the last thing. I think the other thing that, uh, uh, that, that motivated me to say Steve Wells is that we just needed a pastor. You know, we needed a pastor. And we needed a pastor that had the respectability 
not from the African American community, but from the white evangelical community in particular, who would hear him without criticism. And so, and then somebody that knew how to speak not only prophetically, but poetically. So out of his eloquence, it was not offensive. It was an invitation to say, look, we got a problem in America. We got a problem in the world. And in the face of a pandemic, this would be a great opportunity for all of us to stand shoulder to shoulder together. And he did that. And so the relevance of his message is that it was born out of the scripture and it was raised out of the scripture context. And so we went to church at that moment. And, and, that, and, and that's what we needed to hear because we had heard, and, and I appreciate the social uh, crit critiques that have been made from the uh, sociologists and anthropologists, the politics. We need that. I mean, that's a part of what, but also on a day like that, you need to hear from what God says to the church and to the world. And so unapologetically, I knew that Steve would stand up and do that, that it wouldn't be a motivational expression. It would be from the scripture. And at that moment, people knew that we were, we were in church. And so that was some of the reasons I believe that the Lord had laid him on my heart and to be a catalyst to say, would you accept him? And he was accepted. Ralph, it was, uh, it was powerful. Your invitation um, and your blessing of Steve was powerful and what Steve shared was truly uh, impactful and uh, was a word heard as was yours pass uh, around the world. And it continues to reverberate in very real and encouraging ways. Well, Steve, uh, you alluded to this earlier on. I, I wonder if we can unpack it a bit. I understand that once COVID-19 abates and we're praying, aren't we, uh, collectively, that we, are, this, yeah. um, uh, we need a vaccine and uh, we need the Lord to um, inspire and enable. Uh, but once COVID-19, love hopes all things, abates and mm -hmm. people are able to more, move more freely throughout your city, that I understand that South Main and the Church Without Walls are going to team up to combat racism not only within, but also beyond your congregations. So I thought it might be of, of great value for the two of you to reflect a bit uh, upon how you envision this happening in tangible terms and how this might be portable and applicable and doable in other contexts. Yeah, thanks. First, uh, past Billy, thank you. That's it was incredibly kind and uh, I felt like an audacious invitation, like it was a risk uh, when you invited me to speak and I, I felt the burden of that and your words today are really humbling. Uh, I would note for the record, if you go back and look at that service, I spoke for six minutes and 46 seconds. Uh, I know because it's all that's recorded. I think Ralph spoke for about a minute and a half uh, and I thought when he was done, man, that's what I should have said. So. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> it was, I mean, it is cogent and effective when Ralph speaks. <laughs> um, Ralph alluded to something that I think is really, a, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. Uh, e. Herman Westmoreland was the pastor at South Main from 1938 to 1972, decades. Uh, working really on the right side of things in our city. And he came to be close friends with L.H. Simpson, who was the founder and the pastor of the Pleasant Hill Baptist Church in Fifth Ward. But they worked side by side for, I mean, literally decades. And sometime in the 60s that these two friends were talking and they asked one another, you know, what can we do uh, that will show this city that we can move past the divisions between us. And they actually entered into a pact that whichever one of them died first, the other one would preach the service. Uh, and in 1967, uh, L.H. Simpson died. And, you know, people, there were, he was the moving force in the yes, African-American uh, community. That, that church does things. Uh, and I'm confident there were a lot of folks who thought, now I'm going to get the nod. I'll be the one who comes to do that. But it was Dr. Westmoreland who preached that service. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I've, I've thought about that story a lot. I, I didn't know that story. We, we didn't, they did, I know lots of stories about South Maine, but I hadn't heard that one, but past told it to me. 
And Harvey Clemens, who's the pastor at Pleasant Hill, told that to me. And I have done some reading uh, in, in our archives, uh, what I can find online. We're going to tell that story a lot at South Main. And, and it struck me that they entered into a partnership. They did work together. And that yielded a friendship, which led them into worship, which became a witness. And that's sort of the rubric that, that w- through which we're thinking. You know, we, we have a work that we want to do, but, but we're mindful it's, it's going to begin in, in a deep relationship. We're going to find ways to get our folks around tables together, um, not just for a one-off conversation here and there. I, I, I'm no kidding, all for a pulpit swap, swap. I would love to preach in front of his congregation, and I'm not— yeah, but it makes me nervous for him to preach in front of mine. Um, As it should. For, for the reasons we've cited before. He preaches shorter than I do and better than I do every dad gum week. Um, but, but really, ask, ask families in our congregations to make a decision to do what we've done and build individual friendships. Some of that is to tell these stories that I, I think I'm hearing for the first time. Pass has told some about what happened when he moved into his house and uh, a time when they were decorating for, I mean, just stories that I had not heard before. We should do that. But more than that, when's your daughter's birthday? And, and what, what, what happened yeah. last time your son did this? What, just to be friends. And, and as that happens, then when we have engagement in worship, it really is not strangers coming together, but brothers and sisters, because what we're after, I and mean, we want to do work of racial justice. Don't get me wrong. We're going to do that in our city. But deeper and wider than that, we want an expression of Christian unity. Uh, the reality is, and this is painfully true, the black church is an invention of the white church. White people did not allow black people to come through their churches. And so the black church came about. Now that God has used that, uh, you know, uh, Pass has tools in his uh, homiletical toolbox that are not available in mine. Um, but there's really only one church. We worship the same Lord and Master. Uh, Ephesians says that the unity of the church bears witness to the principalities and powers to the victory of the cross and the power of the resurrection. And so we intend to embody that in Houston. May, may it be so. Uh, yeah. neither, neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male and female. I never can tell if Ralph's the barbarian and I'm the Scythian or how that works out, but we're all going to come in there together. (laughs) I think think the point, right, is that um, differences are not eradicated, but they're they're relativized because of the very thing that you said, Steve. You know, one day in the halls at Truett, Joe Parker uh, was a student there. You know, Joe shamed us all because he worked harder than the rest of us. Um, but there was, we were having a conversation and somebody, well-meaning, said, I don't see you as a black man. I just see you as a man. Uh, and Joe uh, very graciously said, if you don't see me as a black man, then you are denying the beautiful diversity of God's creation. If all you see me as is a black man, then you've missed that Christ has made us brothers. And I thought that was about as good as it gets. Yes. Pass, um, you're a pastor to pastors. Uh, You're a a leader uh, of leaders. I wonder if you might share with us some wisdom. Uh, Give us some guidance as ministers Ministers in training, there are any number of seminary students uh, who are listening in, leaning in even now, uh, and church members alike. I know that there are a lot of folks from the Church Without Walls in South Main that are watching and joining us even now. Uh, What guidance can you offer? What wisdom can you give in tumultuous and trying times like these. I mean, I do think it's fair to say uh, these are the times that test our souls. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it may not be unique time in history, but boy, it seems distinct. 
and yeah. um, what 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 can you share with us? What can you see, past that you can help us see? Yeah. <clears throat> I feel like now Job, who's waiting on God to say something, and he's silent. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> But I, but out of that, uh, I think one of the one of the things I would say to pastors and church leaders and just members is to remember that God is still in control. Mm. Um, that was one of the things that happened, I believe, in the life of Job through the series of multiple questions that are being asked and not answered. When God finally responds, he reminds Job and anybody else who would listen is to say, I haven't abdicated the throne. That as turbulent and testing as the times may be, I'm still Lord of the universe. I created it and I control it. We used to sing a little song in church. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got you yeah. and me, brother, in his hand. He's got you and me, sister. He's got the whole world in his hand. And that speaks volumes today when you look at protest on one hand, pandemic on the other, poverty, a kind of triple trifecta or, or this trifecta of trouble. And you say, but God still has the world in his hand. I mentioned that uh, God's control because the larger God is, the smaller our problems become. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's one of the things that we should reflect, not only in our preaching and praying and our music and our witnesses to remember that this great God and the larger he is, or we commanded to magnify him, then all of our problems begin to minimize in the face of that. That's, that's the one thing that I would say. Another one would be to be patient. Pastor A. Lewis Patterson used to say, uh, and I remember once he was invited to do the installation service of a pastor and he was to give a charge to the pastor. And he said, I have three things to say this morning. He said, the first thing is be patient. And then he said, the second word is be patient. <laughs> and then the third word, he raised his voice, no, shrugged his shoulders and said, be patient. And everybody laughed, but I, I can't understand that that was really his philosophy of ministry is to be patient. And so my patience, I would say the pastors, church leaders, staff, members, be patient, let God work. He's behind the scene. And because he's behind the scene and we don't see it, doesn't mean that he's not working. And so That's right. be patient and watch God work and see God work. So that would be my God's in control and for us to be patient, you know, and to and literally wait on God, something that most of us have a real difficulty in. And then the last thing I would say to those who have been given the responsibility to handle the word is to proclaim just that, God's word. You know, this is a wonderful time to be heard in the pulpit. As challenging as the physical dynamics are, preaching to empty seats and cameras. And first, thank God that we have technology that we can be heard, Amen. that we can enter into homes that we would never be invited into, people who are attending our services that would never otherwise be there because of their own responsibilities. Here's a great time to open up the book and ask God to speak to us from his word to his people. People are listening now. I really believe that people are listening. People that typically would never listen yep. have finally come to a point where they say, is there a word from the Lord? And our response needs to be, there is a word from the Lord, you know. And, uh, and uh, I'm a preacher, so, you know, I can go on and on. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to I respond, you know, just to some of what, uh, Steve had said, and, and here's a great time to foster great friendships and relationships. Yeah. You know, this is a great time to do that. You know, you're sheltered in place, you're at a distance, but this gives a good time. Pick up the phone, make the call, and that's another way of saying this is what God is saying to me in turbulent times like this. Here's a time to foster 
great friendships and and relationships. And uh, I'll talk more about that, I'm sure, before we have to go about uh, the fostering of that uh, with Steve in South May. Can I jump on just for one second into that? My colleague, Greg Funderburk, wrote a devotion. It'll, I'm sure you can find it on our website. It's certainly in our Facebook stuff yesterday. And it just hit me where I live. And he was talking about just that, the be patient. Uh, and he quoted a section of Melville's Moby Dick about when the, the, the boat goes out to hunt mm -hmm. the whale, that everybody is working and rowing and there's, everyone is focused and engaged except for one person. And he is languid, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. still, and, calm. and that's the harpooner. Mm -hmm. Because when the moment comes, he has to have his energy and he has to be focused. And if you spend all his energy row rowing the boat, he won't have energy to throw the dart. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, for me, the, the, there are so many things clamoring for our attention these days. And it is so easy to become an oarsman when you're a harpooner. Mm -hmm. But this isn't a pleasure cruise. There, there's a work to be done. And, and for such a time as this to be set aside to proclaim the word and to focus your energy there and be able to say no to other things so that you can say yes to that thing. At, at our church, we say we say no with conviction so we can say yes with abandon. Mm -hmm. but, but to really pray and ask God, what's the thing you're asking me to do? And, and to, to rigorously set aside time for that and to give yourself permission. You need oarsmen but we have churches yeah. be a harpooner. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, fellas, speaking of preaching, I know that there are any number of folks out there uh, who might not have had a chance to join either South Main or the Church Without Walls online who are eager to hear, what is it that you've been preaching, Steve? What is it that you've been preaching past uh, in these past days as you look to the next days? What, what might the Lord be laying on your heart? And what are you hoping that the people of God are, are hearing and are doing at South Main and at the Church Without Walls? Steve, get us rolling and then pass, take up the baton. Mm -hmm. uh, I just see what Pass did three months ago and, and copy this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, right. I, I, I basically, I really, I've had sort of three movements to the preaching this year. It's been my observation that at least the last three cycles in presidential election years, we get all foamed up in the fall. Uh, mm -hmm. There are people who get paid a lot of money to make everybody angry because somebody has figured out the emotion that is most likely to cause you not to vote for their person, but to vote against the other person <laughs> is fear or anger. So I, I own that to the church in the spring. And so the spring, I, we called it forgiveness stories. And we, we're just trying to expand our capacity to let go and forgive. Uh, and we had a plan and then we had this pandemic. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I made a list of things I thought that we would experience personally. I'm not, y'all both know, not normally a topical preacher, mm -hmm. but thought through the grief of the life that we wanted that we don't have, the sense of isolation, how to find blessing in the present, how to parent with your kids underfoot all the time. And I, I actually called a therapist and set a 30-minute appointment every week with a therapist that I trust uh, immensely and said, would you please give me your most practical how-to counsel on if somebody came in experiencing this, what behaviors would you tell them to engage to get healthy? And tried to offer that because I just thought we needed a big dose of it. Uh, we just started last week. We're from now until Christ the King Sunday. Uh, South Main is going to walk through the Sermon on the Mount. I, I think this fall we need a great big dose of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we need a great big dose of kingdom ethics so that nobody else is telling us this is who you are whose you are or what you should do. Mm. We're going to turn to Jesus for that. Mm. That's amazing, Steve. I, I'm actually been doing some work on the Sermon of the Mount for the fall. Yeah. See? That, that should be interesting. Yeah. I did this wrong. I was supposed to be two months behind you. <laughs> isn't that something? Wow. I just, but that's, isn't that the way the Spirit works? <laughs> It is. Yeah, I, I've actually I've actually been thinking about that. Yeah. Preaching through the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, I started planning next year for in the summer to preach through 
uh, all of the minor prophets, a, a big biographical sermon on the minor prophets, try to carve out a niche for that. But mm -hmm. I too have been taking the same kind of journey, uh, Todd, in preaching. I've been looking at what's been uh, happening in the world uh, in the words of Bart, I've had double vision, you know, an eye in the newspaper, eye in the scripture. And then to, uh, while I'm reading through, just hear God speak from his, from his word. And so uh, I've had multiple series over the last 17 weeks, little mini series. And one that I had was called On the Other Side of the Mess, you know. And I chose that word mess because... That's kind of kids when they get flustered and they don't want to detail what that is. They just say, it's just a mess, you know. <laughs> and so played off of that whole idea of on the other side of the mess. And then looked at situations throughout the scripture, which you don't have to look for, of people that were in a human mess and, that, and you know, national and personal and religious and devotional, whatever it is. And just see what it looks like on the other side of that mess, you know. And in each case, you know, that there's a difficulty while people are going through it, but God brings them out on the other side of the mess. I'm doing a series now uh, off of some uh, passages, uh, Ahijah the prophet who tears up his new garment, you know, and gives it to Jeroboam, you know, you know, you know tear it up or rip it up and then this Sunday, break it up at Jeremiah 19 and then Ezekiel, you know, that kind of thing, you know. So, so uh, I, I got one, I think, in Acts 8, a uh, 12, where it's going to be uh, tied up or something. So it's rip it up, break it up, dig it up, tie it up, you know, <laughs> just, just uh, for people to hear these statements and then, but to dig through the scriptures, you know, to remind them. And that's kind of in the face of this whole protest, okay? you know, so my thing is to say, we've seen the protests in the street. What's going to be the prophetic protest? You know, what is the church going to say? And each one of them are deeply rooted in the scripture. The big, the big idea of all of them, really, I guess, is, is that there are times where God tells you to put on a demonstration when words don't work because he's about to do something dress, drastic, uh, yeah. dramatically different, you know. That's why I said this is a, wonderful season for preaching. I really try to encourage people who have to preach. Don't get frustrated. You know, don't worry yeah. about, you know, uh, trying to write out a blockbuster. Here's a time where people, they just want to hear what God has to say to them from the word. And then a young man called me yesterday from, uh, I think it was uh, Pennsylvania. And he was just asking me, you know, I've noticed your preaching has changed. I said, what do you mean by that? He was talking about the application aspect. I said, well, that's not hard. I said, uh, this is the big leap that all preachers grapple with on how to take the church from then to now, you know. And so I said, just look at what's happening with you in the world. That's all you have to do. You just look at the world. You know, I told him one of the great prophetic speeches ever made was Motown's The Temptation Ball of a Confusion, you know. It said, that's what the world is today. Hey, hey, a ball of confusion. I said, I said, so, so I said, so you don't have to look far to talk about what's taking place in the world. I mean, you know, as I tell you, know, protests in the streets is one thing, but then there's prophetic protest that God has called us to be as prophet priests and to speak to the world, you know, the battles that people are doing in their human hearts. So we got a lot to preach. And uh, I told my church though, that after the pandemic, I'm coming back. I said, these are some good outlines. I'm going to preach all these again with people in the pews. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. That's what I'm going to be working on. Yeah. Just in, just in case they didn't hear it the first time. And even yeah. if they did, it won't hurt to hear it again. <laughs> That's exactly right. I always tell them, I said, I've been singing the same songs every week for the last 30 years. And nobody ever complained. You can stand to hear my sermon twice. You know? yeah, Fred Craddock says, uh, some, you know, when you're driving in the car and you hear a song on the radio, it's not the one mm -hmm. you've never heard before that makes you turn it up. That's it's right. You've heard before and you yeah. want to hear it again. Said yeah, some sermons you, that's right. Said some sermons you yeah. never should have preached the first time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but some sermons, you preach them again and again. Yes, sir. That, that's how I feel about it. And the, that's the funny way the spirit works in all that. So I told you we're working through the Sermon on the Mount. So August 28th, be blessed are the peacemakers. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and the week before that's the anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Church Without Walls Choir and South Main's right. Choir are, are doing a virtual choir together. Mm-hmm. And the song they picked is called Let There Be Peace yeah, on Earth. Peace. Yeah. Well, guess when that's going to be the anthem at South Main? Mm-hmm. I mean, just, mm-hmm. you know, when you start that ball rolling, uh, and it really just talking to our team, talk to your counterparts, find something we can do. Lo and behold, the spirit will orchestrate ways to bring mm-hmm. all of these things together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I agree. In, in, in my happiest place, this can go on and on and on and on, but you all have much work to attend to. So I think that in the interest of your time, uh, we'll kind of turn the corner and head down the home stretch. So Steve, mm-hmm. um, do, do you have a word of encouragement for those that are watching and listening today and then pass? Few can bring it home like you can. So <laughs> would you share some final thoughts and then would you just conclude this webinar in a word of prayer? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Steve. So the, yeah. So um, 11 years ago, no, nine years ago is when really pass and I got to know each other. Uh, and there was a history in Houston. There were th- three ministers. Uh, Sam Karp was the rabbi at Beth Israel. Bill Lawson was the founding pastor uh, uh, um, uh, at Wheeler oh, Avenue yeah. Baptist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Joe Fiorenza was the Catholic uh, archbishop uh, in Houston. And they did an enormous lot of good for the city. And we just started asking the question, who's doing that today? And so we, we made a decision to become friends. It wasn't that our paths naturally crossed. It wasn't that we had friends in common and somebody introduced us. It was that, well, you brought us together. Um, But then we made this decision to become friends, believing God would do something with that. And every pastor, I think, ought to, in these days, when we know the, the original sin of our nation is racism, make a friend. You don't have to have had one from boyhood or girlhood. Mm-hmm. Choose to make a friend and, and not so that your church can do something next week or next weekend and not so you can do a one-time event and check it off. Choose to be friends, make regular appointments to have lunch together, talk about your families together, get to know one another, make a regular habit of praying for one another, uh, send each other texts on Sunday morning that encourage mm-hmm. them to preach well. I mean, just become friends and believe that God will do something extraordinary out of that mm-hmm. Good word. Uh, uh, as, as we close <laughs> as we close Steve has reported that story twice and uh, and he's right uh, Dean you you are really the magnet that magnetized yep. us into our corner near but it happened before the plane landed. I remember I was searching through the screen. It was in those days, Continental Airlines. And they had a classical section and they had John Rutter's Requiem posted and uh, I wanted to hear it when I saw the Lord is my shepherd. I said, I I wanna listen to Rutter's Requiem. And I I listened to him move us from darkness to light and and a, Somebody came on the side of me, on the right side of me, and uh, introduced himself. I'm Steve Wells. And at that point, South Main. And it was as if I had known Steve for seven, eight, nine years. And, um, and then for the next 10, 11 days, I think 10 days, we spent every day together. Yep. Uh, talking and laughing and eating and uh, finding out interest and likes. Preaching was just evident, but other likes and things. He's a big hunter. My daddy was a hunter, but I never got a chance to hunt. And I said to him then, I said, that's something I always wanted to do. And so this fall, he and I are going going. hunting. Uh, I'm going with him. And so when people are looking for words of encouragement, uh, and waiting for them to sound like a well-crafted sermon on Sunday. Sometimes the greatest sermon that you'll pre- preach is the one that Jesus preached 
when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mm. It's then that we beheld the glory of the forgotten, begotten of the only God of truth. We, we then at that moment really start preaching the gospel. And so I would say, as Clyde Fan and his idea of preaching, incarnational preaching, put flesh and blood on preaching. Mm -hmm. People know that you can do it in the pulpit. Put flesh and blood. Do like Steve did to me, whether I recognized him or not. He didn't take an attitude taught that he got up and walked the aisle on the plane and said, I'm Steve Wells. And that might be the preaching that we need to do the most right now, to put flesh and blood on it and walk across the aisle, introduce ourselves, and in some ways demand friendship. He mentioned our churches working together. I taught our minister music, and I knew about the music that they were planning, and I said, man, that's going to be great. I said, but it's going to be greater. When we can get together in a space and already preach enough and preach for each other and things like that. But I look forward to him being with us. I do look forward to that. But it's really going to be good when you have your friend coming to come preach for you. That's so right. put some flesh and blood on it. That'll be my word to those that are here and now in ministry, especially those who are younger. Build great relationships right now, lasting yeah. friendships that will have dividends that pay off over the next 30, 40, 50 years of your preaching ministry. The Lord will be praised if we do that. Yep, you'll be praised, yeah. Amen. Well, Pass, before you have the final word leading us in prayer, let me just say on behalf of all uh, who are participating, watching, um, Pass, thank you. Steve, thank you. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your lives. Uh, thank you for preaching the word in season and out of season. Uh, we look to the Lord, but we also look to leaders just like you uh, as we seek to be found faithful in these days. Uh, a couple of announcements for those uh, who would care to know. Uh, two weeks from now, I'll have an opportunity to visit with the president and CEO of Compassion International, uh, Jimmy Miata. Uh, I encourage you to join us for that next installment of Todd Talks. Uh, it's a, uh, an organization that both Steve and Ralph are aware of and that, uh, in fact, one of Ralph's uh, former colleagues at the Church Without Walls, Arbra Bailey, now has a very responsible position mm -hmm. with Compassion International. So uh, it's an organization that does uh, a lot of good for a lot of folks uh, far Amazing. and near. And so we'll be yeah. eager to hear from Jimmy Miato. And then um, on the corner mm. of uh, your Brady Bunch squares today, you have seen uh, the African American <laughs> Preaching Conference advertised. Would you please note with me that this is going to be virtually uh, delivered? And there are a veritable who's who of folks that are proclaiming the word. Would you please pursue that link? Go out online. Registration is uh, so accessible and affordable for all. Uh, would you please make that investment in your own ministry, in your own personal enrichment uh, by being a part of this year's African American Preaching Conference? And I'll just say once again, to follow a line that Steve and Ralph have already established, this is not something that we're doing because we think that it is uh, something that uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, that, that we can seize upon. Uh, this is an ongoing commitment that Truett Seminary has had. Uh, in fact, uh, one would be hard pressed to find two pastors that have been more supportive of Truett over the years. And uh, we have valued greatly uh, uh, black preaching, and this is an, simply an extension and a continuation of something that has been an ongoing yeah. commitment. Grateful right. for the work of Dr. Gregory uh, in particular, uh, who has built uh, a lot of bridges that we love getting to go uh, across time and again. Uh, 
that's what I have to share. Uh, and uh, uh, once again, Steve, Ralph, thank you so much. Pass, would you bless us with a closing? I will. Let's do it. Our Father, thank you for our brief but meaningful time together with Dean and with Steve and myself and our listening audience, friends and colleagues and students, our church members. Thank you for encouraging us through conversation. And thank you for allowing us to model what it really looks like, the church looks like, what a corner feels like uh, in this conversation today. Would you bless each fresh and anew with your amazing grace, we pray. Amen. Amen. Steve. Thank you all. Thank you. Grateful for you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Church Network. Thanks, friends, for joining us. Thank you, Dean. Good to see you. Love you, brother. Love you, Ralph. We're going to get together soon. Steve right. Wells. I'll soon and very soon. You. I'll talk to you shortly. Okay. That's right. All Take right. care, Matt. All right, Thanks, then. Guys.